Hello, 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 and welcome back, you intrepid explorers and archaeologists alike. I hope passports and bug spray are at the ready, because we are about to get down and dusty inside the top 10 ancient architectural wonders of the world. Obviously, I could do the classics like Petra, the Pyramids of Giza, Bora Badar, or Teotihuana, but I want to shake it up and throw in some unexpected names on the list like Baalbek, Lebanon. Yeah, check that out. That's right. Roman-style Colosseum smack dab in the middle of Lebanon. Doesn't feel weirdly out of place at all. The Greeks and the Romans called it Heliopolis, the city of the sun. No relation to the other Heliopolis classic city in Egypt. Alright, so this bad boy, in the words of Robert Byron, dwarfs New York into a home of ants with its awe-inspiring temples, porticos, courtyards, and palatial stone stairways. One temple, that of Jupiter, catches the most attention because there was definitely some kind of previous temple built here before the Romans and the Greeks Jupitered it all up. Likely by the Phoninicans, but the incredibly massive stones used for the foundation are baffling to archaeologists. The blocks are the largest man-made ever known to the world history and weigh anything from 800 to 1500 tons each, depending on whose calculated estimates you trust. Either way, it's heavy as hell. How and why these unnecessary, gigantic, and cumbersome blocks were cut and used is still unknown, and why this construction was so uniquely and equally mysterious. Most baffling of all is why there is no written or even oral records why the Romans or the Phonicans even built this singular site, unlike so many others. Apartment buildings. We've been building and living in these bad boys since the literal dawn of time, and the national monument, Montezuma Castle in the USA, is proof. President Roosevelt declared this ancient five-story apartment complex one of America's first national monuments, located inside Camp Verde, Arizona. Montezuma is a beast, straight up stone and mortar marvel of early architectural engineering. Experts have determined that the castle was built up progressively over three centuries between 1100 and 1350 AD and provided shelter for the Singwa people during flood seasons. Contrary to the belief of the colonizers who discovered the structure and named it Montezuma after the Aztec aka Mexica Emperor who was born literally 40 years after it was already built and abandoned. It was one of those like, oh, all native people must be the same bigotry situation. In reality, the Singwa were the people who inhabited this and they were master traders, hunter-gatherers, spinners, and weavers, and they were also major worldwide traders. They bartered their items and foods for those from hundreds of miles away, and artifacts from foreign states found at the castle stand as proof. Montezuma Castle was a thriving commercial center and traded a variety of goods and ideas. Thus, it's confusing that no one knows why the Singwa left the castle and its surrounding area, but by 1425 AD, everyone was gone. Never judge a book by its cover. Check out the hypnotic Le Mesquita, aka the Great Mosque, at one time the largest in the city and Al Andalus, but now, nearly a millennium later, it stands as a historical site, religious site, and most of all, an incredible site. Look at this interior. The buildings on this site are complex as the rich history they are packing. So, from what historians and archaeologists determined, first thing on the site was a temple for the Roman god Janus. The temple was then converted into a church by the invading Vigoth in 572. Then, in 711, when the Moors took Andalusia from the Christians, the Vigoth structure was divided in two halves and used as a place of worship by both Muslims and Christians. A remarkable act of tolerance, given the fervor at the time. Don't, don't get excited though. Prince Abdul Rahman established control over almost all of the Iberian Peninsula and attempted to recreate Damascus, meaning the church component is destroyed. Instead, he sponsored elaborate building programs, promoted agriculture, and even imported fruit trees and other plants from his former home. Orange trees still stand in the courtyard of the mosque as a beautiful, if bittersweet, reminder of the exile. The historic center of Cordoba reflects thousands of years of occupation by different cultural groups, Roman, Vigoth, Islam, Judaism, and Christian, that all left a mark. A temple like no other. It's very recognizable. It's Angkor Wat, the largest religious site in the world. Although Angkor Wat was no longer a site of political, cultural, or commercial, commercial significance by the 13th century. But unlike many historical sites worldwide, Angkor was actually never 100% abandoned. It just fell into some disuse or disrepair. It was rediscovered in the 1840s by the French explorer Henry Mouhot, who wrote that the site was grander than anything left to us by Greece or Rome. A compliment that can likely be attributed to the temple's design, which is supposed to represent the home of the Hindu and Buddhist gods Mount Meru. The temple 
temple was constructed in the early 12th century by the Khmer king Sodhyavarman II as a dedication to the god Vishnu. However, in legend, many believe the temple's construction was ordered by the god Indra, and the work was accomplished in one night. Taking a look at it here, mm, I don't know, it could be giving instant dream home energy. Maybe it was like Ikea furniture, you just pop it all together, little pieces, boom, done, fast like that. Although it's no longer an active temple, it serves as an important tourist attraction in Cambodia, despite the fact it sustained significant damage during the autocratic rule of the Khmer Rouge regime in the 1970s and the earlier regional conflicts. Angkor is so integral to Cambodian identity, it appears on their national flag. Now we scoot over to Cusco and we check out these eerily perfect rocks, the Saxahoamen of northern Peru. The monumental three-story site dates back to around 1100 BC, with some early sections believed to have been built by the Kililik, but it's the Inca built walls of the 13th century that boggles the minds the most. Built between like 13th century to 1533, what makes this plaza so spectacular is the precision in which the stones were cut and ground to fit together. Honestly, just looking at this, I don't think there's tools that could help a modern person accomplish what they'd managed to do with just hands and stones. They assembled anything without mortar and they're all shaped to fit together so exactly that there's no space at all between them. The method used by the Incas to match the stone are still a mystery, let alone how they transported them thousands of miles to the complex of spot. They're massive, comprising of 6,000 cubic meters of rock reaching up to 200 tons each, and they're mysteriously arranged in this zigzag sky high for purposes unknown. Next up, we visit the largest mud brick building in the world, the Great Mosque of Jean, Mali. As a site on the United Nations World Heritage List, the Great Mosque of Jean is a beloved piece of Mali's cultural history. It was built in the 13th century by the first Jean Islamic ruler and remains one of Africa's most famous buildings. 52 feet high, this bad boy and its surrounding old towns of Jean were slapped with the UNESCO World Heritage Site stamp of approval in 1988. Jean was founded between 800 and 1250 CE. It was an essential stop in the Trans-Saharan gold trade and a significant city to the Mali Empire, the Songhai Empire, and the Tukulear Empire. So that's three for three. Makes sense that King Koi Komboro puts a big old mosque in the center. The Great Mosque then became a center of cultural life and religion, particularly in Islam, with thousands of students studying the Quran. After Jean is conquered in 1819, the semi-destroyed and pillaged city and mosque are left rot until it's once again replaced in 1836 for the third and final time and is completed by 1907. The only original part of the mosque that remains is a small building that houses the graves of local leaders. The world has had a great many things carved out of its stony peaks, but I'd say there is none more impressive than the Leshan giant Buddha of China. Okay, well, maybe the Bamiyan Buddhas of Afghanistan before they were dubbed false gods and well, um, well, you know what happened to them. Hilariously, if you haven't heard, recently the twits who did that are so broke they're now selling tickets to go see the demolished rubble of where those Buddhas once stood. Thank God, because I was worried I wouldn't be able to see the gaping cavity where the wonders once stood instead of the actual wonders themselves, forever lost to time. Anyways, the Lishan is thankfully very well protected and doesn't risk being harpooned. It's the largest stone Buddha statue in the world, carved into a cliff face in this Sichuan province where three rivers meet and facing the sacred Mount Emai. Obviously, this is a very sacred area, but why the Buddha specifically here? The year is 713 during the Tang Dynasty and Hai Tong is concerned for the long-suffering people who earn their living around the tempestuous waters of the three rivers, and they'd often lose their lives to its evil water spirit. So Haitang believed the Buddha would bring the water spirit under control. That and the falling stones during the carving would reduce water force there. So he plans and labors, supposedly for 20 years, to afford the cost of doing this. Even when government officials try to swindle the humble monk out of his money, Haitang said that they could get an eyeball, but not the money raised for the Buddha. Legend has he quite literally dug his eyeball out and officials ran away. The project was half done when Hai Tong passed away and two of his disciples did continue and finish the work. After a total of 90 years, the project was finally completed. The Lashan Giant Buddha scenic area is a sacred site to the Matrian faith, the main belief of the local people. It's a world heritage site that was inscribed in 1996 together with the adjacent Mount Mi scenic area. At the present, the maintenance work is under progress and under instruction of experts from UNESCO. Get ready for some ancient alien crap. This time it's Puma Punko Polivia, meaning the door of the Puma, which is beyond metal. As far as archaeologists know, Puma Punko was a thriving ancient town originating somewhere around 500-600 CE, and its existence causes nothing but a headache and confusion for researchers.
researchers. Puma Punko is displaying a level of craftsmanship that was largely unparalleled in pre-Columbian New World, and it's often considered the architectural peak of the Andean lithic technology. There are stone slabs that weigh 131 metric tons, somehow carried uphill and locked together, all Inca jigsaw pot style. In fact, better than the Incas, because they themselves thought this was the work of gods. Tiwanaku skills not only continue to baffle the modern researchers, but the Incas, who had emulated their mortarless jigsaw puzzle style of engineering, though they couldn't match the Tiwanku's advanced skills when it came to mass production. Tiwanku culture as a whole ended up being significant in Inca traditions. It's all smooth stone structures and precision made cuts, clean right ankles, and expertly fitted joints. The megaliths are among the largest on Earth, and while many of the structures are still standing centuries after their inhabitants disappeared, most of the buildings are scattered and broken around the area, leaving researchers to wonder what could possibly have tossed everything around in broken and possibly heavy buildings. Until recently, there was no way of seeing what Puma Punko may have looked like during its peak. Owing to the work of the University of California's Berkeley researchers, though, Puma Punko's mapping has been brought to the ancient archaeological site into a 3D perspective, and hopefully it can help us solve what destroyed the city this way. Okay, okay, next we have the colorful, world-renowned Minakshi Sundar Sawar Temple of India. This castle is dedicated to the fish-eyed goddess and her loving consort, whom the temple is named after. It is 46 mere pure, chaotic, anarchic jumble of deities, demons, warriors, curvaceous maidens, pot-belly dwarves, and sprites. In all such cartoonishly bright colors, it can't be called anything less than magnificent. Minakshi Aman Temple is one of the oldest and most important temples in India. It's believed that the Lord Shiva assumed the position of Sundar Sarwar and married Pavarti, aka Minakshi, at the site where the temple is currently located. Minakshi emerged out of a yanja as a gift from the Lord Shiva to answer the king's prayer for an heir. Yet a triple deed girl emerged from the sacred fire, not a son. So when the king and his wife expressed concern over the girl's, you know, abnormal appearance, a divine voice ordered them not to fret over her looks. They also informed her that the girl's third bitty will disappear as soon as she meets her future husband. They'll be fine. Minakshi went on to be a total badass woman and just trash everyone in her way, including like the Lord Indra. And she was on her way to capture Kalish, where the abode of Lord Shiva as well. When Shiva appears before her, her third D finally disappears. She had met her better half. Instead of conquer ship, the two found love. And Shiva and Manakshi returned to Madari, where they had their wedding on the place of what's now the temple. And now the last, but never the least, and quite certainly the beast, underground churches of Libella, Ethiopia. 11 churches, each carved out of a singular red stone. Oh yeah, these babies are top of the list for a reason. Some 645 kilometers from Addis Baba, the monolithic churches are attributed to King Lalibela, who set out to construct what was deemed a new Jerusalem in the face of Christian pilgrimages to the Holy Land, being halted by Muslim conquests. There's some dispute between historians about Ethiopians or Armenia being the first country to convert to Christianity, but the edge probably goes to Ethiopia and King Lali, which was then called Abyssinia. What really gets me is how they're all connected via underground tunnels, but also their positioning. The roofs of the churches are at ground level. They're all underground to make use of natural aquafillers. Together, they form a pilgrimage site with particular spiritual and symbolic value, with the layout representing the holy city of Jerusalem. Seeing as Lalibela reigned from 1181 to 1221, but the churches he built are still in use today and attract about 100,000 visitors per year, many of whom make that pilgrimage on foot. One could argue that, yeah, the king was successful in making a new Jerusalem. Even between prayer sessions, the churches are never empty. Elderly worshippers find it easier to stay nearby than negotiate the precarious paths. When UNESCO World Heritage Site Program began in 1978, the rock-hewn churches of Lalibela were one of the inspirations to even start it, and one of the first 12 sites to be protected by the UN. Alrighty, thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe, and until next time, be sure to comment some love down below.